again, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. You're in the right space if you're looking for the People's Social Impact Conference Day 3. Today, we have a wonderful panel, as always, but when we're talking about credit unions, that touches a special place in my heart since I bank with three of them. And we are going to be talking about credit unions and community impact in Canada. But just before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. And just before we begin, we always like to begin all things by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we are on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we still stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. My name is Ryan Knight, one of the co-founders of the Afro-Caribbean Business Network and one of the board members of SETSI, the social, social economy through social inclusion, who presents to you day three of the People's Social Impact Conference. And again, I'm truly honored to be uh, here with our panel, Susan Henry from Alterna Savings, Liz Arkenstall from Libro Credit Union, and Maureen Young from Coast Capital. But I'll go one by one so that you can tell us a bit about your background. And I'll start with you, Susan, if you wanted to give us uh, a bit about the work that you do. Sure. First, um, I want to say thank you to Seth, see the team and um, Victor for his leadership for the work that they're doing and bringing um, you know, this conference to light um, in terms of the social economy. Um, you know, when I look at the array of topics in the forum, it's just remarkable. So first, thank you to the leaders of this. It's one of the best I've seen so far. So again, um, my thanks. Um, I'm Susan Henry, Director of Community Impact um, and Financial Inclusion with Alterna Savings Credit Union. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Alterna, um, we've been good in banking for over 115 years, so we've been around since 1908. We are a full-service member-owned cooperative financial institution outside of Quebec, and Alterna shares its expertise with more than 210,000 members and a network of over 40 branches across Ontario. Um, in my role, I lead our community impact department. Um, which focuses on three pillars, um, our community financial resiliency program, our community microfinance program, our community financial education program and donations. Pleasure to be here. Wonderful to have you. And Liz, I'll go to you next. Tell us a bit about your background and the work that you do. With sure. Libro. Yeah, thank you. And and yes, I, I was uh, had the pleasure of joining a panel yesterday and the lineup is of content is really great. So yes, thanks. Thanks to Setsi. Um, I'm Liz Arkenstall, Purpose Integration Manager, and I'm uh, leading kind of our efforts to embed our purpose beyond profit in, in everything that we do. And, and so currently I'm working on, um, we, we're developing a new strategy. So we ha have uh, uh, refreshed our purpose statement. Um, so we'll be developing kind of our purpose goals around that. And I'm also working on our ESG and how our environmental governance uh, goals and and um, and plans uh, help to bring our purpose to life. And, and so uh, a big part of what I've been doing recently is on our climate change efforts, but also community impact um, falls under uh, our group as well as as diversity, equity, and inclusion, and so um, a, quite a number of things that we're working on. But uh, and we're we're kind of at a at a pivotal moment right now with a, a new strategy ready to roll out um, later this year. So we're going to be kind of realigning our community investment in support of some of those tweaks that we've made around our our purpose and our our vision. Love that, and really appreciate you being here. And I'll go to Marie next to give us a bit of background on the work that you're doing with Coast Capital. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, great to great to here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Maureen, and I'm uh, the Vice President of Social Purpose at Coast Capital. And uh, we are a B-based federal credit union. Uh, our headquarters are in Surrey. Uh, British Columbia. We have uh, about 45 branches, uh, 600,000 members approximately, um, and about 1,800 employees. We are a B Corp, uh, and I'm. if I look a little tired, 
because <laughs> I've been uh, knee deep in the B Corp Champions Retreat all week. So uh, uh, it's been such yes, a yes. fantastic event of uh, purpose led businesses. So it's super inspiring. Uh, uh, so we're B Corp since uh, 2018. Um, we adopted a social purpose in 2020. Uh, and so that's been a fantastic evolution for our organization and uh, really allowing us to look at how we can drive impact in a much greater way than uh, than we had previously. Uh, we are, we've been very involved in our communities for many, many years. Um, uh, we contribute 10% of our budgeted bottom line back into the communities we serve. And we actually hit 100 million invested in communities um, in 2023, since 2000, uh, since the year 2000. So a big, big milestone for us, which we're feeling really excited about. Uh, we're also a signatory to the Net Zero Banking Alliance, which means that we've committed to reach Net Zero, uh, not only through our operational missions, but through our financed missions by the year 2050 or sooner. So like Liz, we are knee deep in figuring out how to <laughs> make that happen and uh, understanding our missions and starting to think through some of the strategies that we'll need to be employing. Um, so the philanthropy, our social purpose work, the, our climate action um, would all be areas that fit in my portfolio. Excellent. And I appreciate you giving that context. So Liz, I'll go to you next to also add to the context of the work you do with Libro, because as a leader in this credit union ecosystem, what does community investment and inclusion look like to you? Yeah, um, you know, when I was thinking about the conversation today, I think, um, you know, I'm talking to a couple people in my team, often we think about community impact as those things that are highly, invis highly visible, uh, community investment type things. And, and so I really would say we're, we kind of break down how we see our impact on community coaching that we provide. So as a purpose-driven organization whose goal is to strengthen the financial well-being of our owners and our communities, um, we're really, you know, trying to uh, continuously hone and tweak how we're offering that advice and that coaching. That's one aspect of, of you know, how we are uh, able to strengthen that financial well-being piece is to, to provide that. And so we also think about our role as an employer, as a living wage employer, um, as having a presence in our community. So bricks and mortar as well as technology. So we see our impact on community being physical as well as, you know, kind of that broader community piece as well. Um, we've got over 800 employees. We're also based in, in Ontario as well. And, and as a living wage employer, um, both both paying our staff a living wage, but also supporting that movement. So they're they're a, a partner that we've worked with over a number of years to try to encourage others to uh, uh, start paying a living wage as well. Um, and then, of course, our presence and investment in the communities as well are, are critical. And what we've been trying to do over the past number of years um, is really aligning our community investment to our goals around diversity, equity, and inclusion, to our goals around climate, and also to our overall uh, purpose as an organization. So really moving from philanthropy to kind of these um, much more kind of mutually beneficial uh, partnerships that we work with organizations to try to get at root cause issues. And so I, I noted, you know, currently we have four pillars that we work on and, and we're, we're revisiting those. And, and since that time that we had uh, determined those four pillars, we, we really think there's opportunity for us to be more inclusive and more purposeful in who and how we try to partner with. And so we're really just starting on that journey, but that's a, a big uh, piece of it as well. Love that. And Susan, I'll round up this question with you as well to give us a bit more context on the work that you do with Alterna and what does community investment and inclusion look like to you as a leader in this space that's been engaged in it for, I won't date you, so I'll just let you talk about uh, your experience in it. You can definitely bring me on that age thing, but um, I would say really when I think about community investment inclusion, particularly from our community impact um, pillars, 
I mean, a huge element of community investment and inclusion is really ensuring that underserved and underrepresented groups have access to our financial systems, mm -hmm. because this really can lead to financial well-being and, and resiliency. And when I envision our financial systems and structures, it should include a wide range of appropriate and affordable financial products and services for all, and particularly those who are economically poor and socially marginalized. I really believe that we have the ability and the responsibility to come to our practice of work in the financial system um, to create real tools and solutions that can address these types of economic gaps for those who are excluded from our financial systems. And so it's really important that we look to improve the lives of our community members and to ensure that our profits have a higher purpose. And I know that's what we do as credit unions um, within the system. So if I was to look particularly at Alterna, um, we focus on how we are enhancing the well-being of our community through access to financing and financial education. And a few examples of these is really how do we improve access to affordable housing through partnerships with our co-op housing and affordable housing partners? How do we create meaningful employment through starting and expanding businesses through our community microfinance program? And how do we provide financial education to strengthen the financial capacity of our members and communities through our community financial education? So. And also community investment and inclusion should, in, should not be done in silo with financial institutions or financial systems. It has to be in collaboration with communities. That's an integral part of any work is understanding the communities you're working with. So we have close ties to the communities and local organizations that share the same values and goals of strengthening and empowering individuals in our communities. Wonderful. And if I can stay with you just for a sec, because I would love for you to dig a bit deeper into, you know, you mentioned financial inclusion, but based on your experience, what actionable insights have you gained over those years of your important work? Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important actionable insights is, again, I go back to how do we actively engage with underserved groups? Um, I believe you cannot address social, financial, and economic exclusion without addressing how it impacts the communities that you're aiming to help and, you know, and understanding what are the needs of the communities. So I think based on that for us, um, we focus on our work again on making an impact on the lives of the individuals in the communities that we're serving. Um, we also look at helping community organizations continue with their important work by ensuring that we're offering tailored products and services to support the unique needs of their sector. And again, strengthening the financial resiliency and capacity and independence of individuals and of the organizations that we are working with. So I think that the work we've done through our programs can also be applied to other facets of community financial development, because I think we have to look further into things like asset development, improving access to affordable housing and home ownership within our communities. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm a little bit out of breath because I have a cold. And oh, I no. think that we need to understand that investing in underserved communities is good for business and good for economy. It's not charitable work. Um, mm. It's a long-term solution that helps to build sustainable communities and for financial institutions, it also is a win-win, meaning that when you invest in these communities that you are also um, becoming more profitable as well. <laughs> Excellent. I'm gonna Appreciate go off screen for a little bit. <laughs> oh, no worries, yes. And Maureen, I'll come to you just as we're talking about the years that you've been in this work. When you talk about financial inclusion, what has been some actionable insights you've gained as well with your important work? Thank you. Well, it's it's um it's been quite an interesting journey for me at Coast. I've been I've been with the organization for quite a long time, uh, coming up to 22 years, uh, and before that, um, had uh, worked in community actually in the nonprofit sector, um, in community economic development, 
um, various various roles and and had a you know really great opportunity to be able to bring some of that experience into into the work at Coast. But what I've seen uh, is sort of the um, the evolution of our organization from you know as, as Susan mentioned uh, perhaps more of a traditional philanthropic approach which which was great and served us well for those for those years but really isn't enough anymore and um, so the last three years you know this shift to embracing a social purpose where we're really looking to drive impact across the entire organization so through our products and services through our practices um, as an employer um, you know the the learning programs that we have, the um, uh, the benefits, the pay to living wage, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, really looking at how we can um, be a little bit more uh, thoughtful and intentional about the impact uh, that we want to make. And it's, you know, I, I would I would double down on um, some of the comments that have been made around, you know, the real. Um, uh, challenging circumstances that people are facing, the rising cost of living, the rising debt levels, um, uh, the stagnation of incomes and the widening income inequality that we are seeing. And that, that was really at the root of um, our desire to uh, get fairly focused on, on where we wanted to make a difference, which was to help people unlock financial opportunities and improve their earning potential. And we saw the the real need for um, for people to have um, more focused support on managing uh, their financial um, uh, uh, debt and their responsibilities, and and maximizing the um, uh, or leveraging the financial education that's available, uh, but then also supporting them around trying to improve their earning potential because just managing your 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 commitments uh, is is not enough like you, you know it's not about budgeting better when the cost of living is so high right it you do actually need to start looking at how you can help people grow their income so that is where we've been uh, really focused on spending our time is thinking about how can how can we make that happen but but one thing I would say in spe specifically about um, financial inclusion is that it really is about building trust and relationships. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for us, um, we are looking to engage with our members differently. Um, you know, shifting, I, I think, you know, when you when you're in the branch and people are coming in and they're wanting to, you know, transact we're trying to help move to more of advice. And, and, and that starts with a conversation. It starts with um, supporting them to really think through um, their financial health. So we've got a, a, a financial assessment um, uh, sort of module that we go through with our members to help them understand, you know, what are their goals? Uh, how are they feeling, you know, from a confidence perspective um, around their uh, their finances and where might we be able to help them. And that's really been important. And then in, in the spring, we're actually going to be um, launching uh, our first survey of our members to understand uh, their financial resilience. And we're hoping we can use uh, the insights from that uh, survey to really start to think about, okay, where are those moments where we can we can help them address some of the barriers or some of the challenges that we're having. So it's much more relationship based, you know, rather than just, you know, oh sure we can help. Wonderful. And I appreciate kind of giving the deep dive of how you're shifting, how you engage with your uh, mm -hmm. not your clients, but your members as but also with Liz would love to get your feedback on actionable insights that you've gained over the years of your important work as well. Yeah, what I thought I might do is just share some of the uh, some examples of some collaborations that we've made that I think really kind of bridge a community investment perspective as well as 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 in service of that purpose to support um, the strengthening of financial well being. And so um, maybe if I just provide a couple of examples. And so 
in the fall of last year, we worked with the financial wellness lab that's hosted at Western University, which is here in London, to better understand the financial resilience um, in the context of household finances and money management. So specifically, we're testing a few hypotheses with them and examining whether Libro owners that utilize, we have a money management app called Yuli, whether people that use that money management app actually demonstrate a stronger propensity for financial resilience to, you know, we, we have these tools and these things that we think are helping people. And, and so really testing out, is that actually uh, a, a, a tool that is useful and that we can literally say, if you use this, you are more likely to be resilient. We know 80% of Canadians right now are not what we would call financially resilient. So how can we play a stronger role in that? And it'll help inform actions to continue supporting owners, um, you know, and then for the lab that's doing this work, um, they are also looking to develop quantitative data, data analytic solutions to enable Canadian households to improve their financial resilience. So we gave them access to the, to the, you know, the, the kind of day to day data that they were looking uh, to, to be able to do their work. And then that's going to also give us um, some insight as to whether one of the specific tools we have is, is doing what we hope it intended to do. Um, another, another example, um, I think that's uh, worth noting, and I think we're, we're trying to do more here, and, and we're just kind of scratching the surface, but there was a recent partnership um, announced a couple of weeks ago supporting Liftoff's Black Entrepreneur Program. It's an initiative by the Caribbean Canadian Association in Waterloo. Yes, yes. Yes, and it's uh, aimed at empowering the Black community in Canada. And so our support will be used specifically for the creation of some micro grants for those individuals for product development, purchase inventories, tools, equipment, et cetera. And so um, I think speaking to that inclusion piece, and so how are we um, you know, really starting to tackle, whether it's through products and services or through partnerships, uh, being able to provide uh, opportunities. And so that's an exciting one that we're, we're looking to um, continue furthering on. And we're and big fans of Trevor and their work out there. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So this is, I think this was just, this is new for us. So. We're just uh, getting into that relationship. Another one that I think um, in, is near and dear to me, and I think sometimes I, I forget to even talk about it, is an Each One Teach One program. So it was originally developed by a credit union uh, out west, Ban City, and it's now managed by the Canadian Credit Union Association. So what it does is trains employees of Canadian credit unions to deliver financial education. It's in plain language. There are no ties to products and services. We are not wearing Libro shirts. Um, it's volunteer driven. It's outside of your name. Um, and, and we do know that, you know, with the pressures people are feeling, uh, information and guidance is just one piece of the puzzle to be able to navigate and improve your financial resilience. But really kind of just meeting people in community, uh, whether it's virtual, whether it's in person, and just really very good information that we're not talking um you know and so last year alone i think um we we trained our staff again and uh there was 40 sessions with over 400 people attending and so we haven't really been able to dig into the impact beyond kind of just knowing the outcomes of how many people um have have been um ha have benefited from it uh, but it's also been interestingly a very very um high staff engagement piece and so staff love it we have some trainers that you know it is their part-time full-time job outside of um work and so that's something nice. that we really want to um, ensure we're continuing on with this as well so just, those are just a couple of examples of things we have on the go i oh, really appreciate that and gonna definitely be following along as those programs develop and but susan i'd love to come back to you because i know we work closely with Alterna's help with us setting up uh, the ACBN microloan program. So when supporting business owners and entrepreneurs, what would be one important piece of advice you can provide to this ecosystem to support the entrepreneurs in, that we're working with? Um, we know that, you know, Canadian, Canadian business owners and entrepreneurs that, you know, they're making important contribution to our Canadian economy. But as you know, Ryan, um, you know, when you're starting and funding a business, um, you starting and growing your business, that funding is still limited. And we see that particularly in underserved groups, such as women, 
um, BIPOC communities, racialized and new Canadians and low income individuals. Um, but, you know, I'm pleased to see that funding is becoming more available in these areas. Um, and I think now we have to look beyond the immediate capital need uh, for the business for their day-to-day -day operations. And we have to think about um, more tools for the business owners so that they can achieve long-term financial success. And, you know, this is something that Liz Mooring touched upon on the fi financial resiliency piece, because success for business owners is not just about their business, but it's about them as individual as well. Um, you know, in my time on in, in this sector, um, you know, I see a lot of small business owners who are not set up for retirement or home ownership. They simply don't have the financial solutions um, readily available, um, you know, when they're ready to buy a home or, or to retire. So, you know, I think we've got to pay more attention there. And so for yeah. us at Alterna, we are continue to look for new ways to work with the communities and organizations and the government to find strategies that's gonna help and improve inclusive access to financing and help to, again, build that wealth and alleviate the poverty in underserved communities. But we know also that there's more that needs to be done. And that's why in addition to offering lending products and advice, that we are investing in more wraparound support in the uh, entrepreneurial community, you know, by helping to develop essential tools that support entrepreneurs and skill in their businesses. So, you know, we do this through a, a, quite a few, we have webinar series, we have sales training, um, investment plans uh, for the um, small business owners. And I think, you know, for us, we are committed to continuing to seek out opportunities, um, again, to work with these um, underserved and, and underrepresented entrepreneurs so that we can see wealth creation in the communities where they're in. Excellent. And Maureen, I would love to kind of go to you as well. I know, Liz, you had touched on some of the collaborations that you're already working on, but Maureen, I would love to hear more about maybe collaborations that exist or initiatives that you'd love to see that would amplify your work? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, I mentioned earlier our deep desire to help people improve their earning potential. And um, so there's a few uh, different ways that we're going about that and very much leaning into collaborations to make that happen. Um, one is with the Construction Foundation of BC. And... Uh, so this is a, a, a registered Canadian charity that um, is really working to help the next generation of skilled workers. And through their research, they discovered that so many um, people who go into the trades stream uh, are not able to succeed and get their Red Seal certification. Like a huge percentage of them, more than 50% who go on to that stream fall off somewhere along the line. And so a bunch of research was undertaken actually through New Brunswick. Uh, and through this program, they discovered that a lot of uh, these folks were struggling with the academic portion of their training due to undisclosed learning disabilities. So, uh, you know, it's they thought if they could find a way to actually support people to um, identify a what the learning disability was, many of them um, actually had never had a diagnosis and, and didn't have any strategies at all for managing their learning disabilities. Um, uh, support them to get through that academic portion, because once you receive uh, uh, achieve your Red Seal endorsement, your uh, lifetime earning potential increases uh, significantly moves you from, you know, subsist subsistence wage to, um, you know, being able to thrive. So we, um, in conversation with the Construction Foundation, thought, well, what would happen if we took that really unique program that had been developed in New Brunswick and we expanded it right across Canada? So we've um, entered into a, a million-dollar partnership with them. They're um, uh, building out this program, which is, you know, primarily serving underserved groups, uh, youth at risk, women, newcomers to Canada, 
people with disabilities and Indigenous people. So it's a terrific uh, program. We're very excited about it um, and really interested to see how that program can be scaled. Um, and most recently, the federal government have also joined uh, as, a, as a partner in the program. And I think that's really going to make quite a significant difference in that group. Another one that I would just mention is, uh, is a recent partnership that we have forged with Coursera. So Coursera uh, is a fellow B Corp. It's an online learning platform. And uh, it's a sort of a subscription-based model. So you pay a certain amount every month, and then you have access to, could be like short form um, video content, um, could be micro credentials, certificate programs, or you can even achieve degrees through the program. We've got about, um, I don't know, 150 leading universities and institutions like Stanford and Yale, but also um, Google, um, you know, so there's some, uh, and Meta are some of the um, sort of more institutional type that are, that are teaching programs. So we've partnered with them. Uh, we're actually going to be um, uh, introducing this as an offering to our members, which is super exciting. Um, but we've also secured uh, 7,000 plus uh, licenses that we are um, distributing to equity uh, seeking groups across Canada and nonprofit organizations free of charge. So free access, you can achieve a full professional certificate um, through this program. Mm -hmm. And again, the, so the outcomes that they are driving through that program um, are pretty significant uh, in terms of people you know, uh, advancing in the, in the job they have, advancing in the career, feeling more confident, um, uh, achieving new um, uh, jobs, uh, or you know, just feeling like they're, they're um, uh, learning even from the personal development point of view. So those would be a couple of examples of um, some collaborations that we're undertaking. Excellent. And is that something that you'd be able to see on the Coast Capital website, or would we have to sign up for the newsletter to find out when it's launching? Yeah, so it's actually launching, I think, April 2nd. So it's just around the corner. And yeah, uh, yeah you'll see it on our website. It'll be uh, it'll be all over the place. So yeah, we're, we're um, we've been sitting on this one for a little bit. So we're very excited <laughs> to finally bring it to life. Hey, glad <laughs> to hear that is just around the corner. And Susan, I'll come to you with knowing that Sorry. community. Oh. Ryan, before you move Susan. to your next question, there's just some a question in the that um, oh. around are there support services available to entrepreneurs who assist in managing cash flow operation budgets once the business is launched? And I think you also know the answers. There are definitely business resource centers like ACBN and such um, across the regions that help um, businesses, you know, with their startup, getting startup um, in terms of helping them with their cash flows and such. And also at Alterna, so you can definitely reach out to us. Um, we have a, a, a business plan and cash flow toolkit um, that we can help you with on a one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, but again, there's resource centers across the regions, and Brian, Ryan, I'm sure you have a list of them that you could provide if needed. Absolutely, and either plugging into the entrepreneur centers across Ontario or the Black Entrepreneurship Ecosystem, now not national, so on organizations that support Black entrepreneurs are part of that ecosystem. So we'll definitely put that information in the chat as well. So thank you for the question, Jess Winder. And yeah, as I was uh, gonna ask you, Susan, really we know community investment is so important but I'm curious if you can touch on some of the specific programs and services that Alterna has implemented that impacts communities. Sure. And I'll speak specifically um, of our community impact department and the work that we do through there and our pillars. So our first pillar is our community financial resiliency program. And this program helps improve the capacity and resilience of the not-for-profit and charitable and cooperative and affordable housing sector to strengthen their financial sustainability. And um, since 2012, we've contributed over 3.8 million back in support to the affordable housing sector. Um, a lot of that goes into scholarships or to help in re 
reduce the member dues in the co-op um, housing. Mm -hmm. um, we service over 4,600 community members um, through our resiliency program. And this is through providing um, financial products. So we have two specific financial products for our nonprofit sector that allows them to get um, value-based banking back. So they it's really good for um, their finance, helping to strengthen their financial capacity. And as you know, our community financial, um, our community microfinance program, and this is around providing access to capital and affordable financial products and services for individuals, entrepreneurs, and organizations. Um, fun fact, the program has been around since June 2000, and that's the year I started Alterna. And um, since um, it's set in its inception, we've issued over 1,500 loans, totaling almost 10 million. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when we think about that program, uh, again, we don't work in silo. We work with community organizations. Um, so along with our own in-house program, we work with a number of community loan funds like ACBN who have their own microloan program um, to reach um, communities who may be a little bit harder to reach um, and can be reached easily through the community loan funds. And we work with over six community loan funds today along with our own microfinance program. And within our community microfinance program, we recognize that there were opportunities for additional products and services uh, for those members. So we have our micro savings uh, program, which allows a uh, entrepreneur to save a percentage um, of their loan back into a savings. And as they pay down their loan, they're wrapping up their savings. And we found that that was especially important as um, entrepreneurs really, again, when we think about financial resiliency, they, um, you know, they were more focused on their business and not thinking about the savings. So this is a committed savings um, that they now have. And we have our, our micro business banking package, which allows us to tailor um, products specifically to also have our community and financial inclusion granting program. And these programs are strengthened the community sector by providing grants opportunities to register charities incorporated nonprofits and cooperatives. And since 2014, you know, we've granted um, um, almost 400,000 um, within our two granting programs. And we have our community financial education program. And these programs are tailored specifically to individual organizations and communities we serve. And just last year, we have over a hundred um, outreach engagements through our community financial education programs. I love that. And I know Liz, you had just put in the chat that you did have to jump off. Did you want to give some closing thoughts and maybe a call to action for the audience that is here watching? Sure. I think, um, you know, as I think about the work that we're embarking on and, and the, what we, what we hope for the credit union system to be uh, supporting um you know, we were on a call yesterday for, for SETSI and, and uh, with another credit union, uh, Meridian, also based in Ontario, and we were talking about, um, you know, using your, the power of where you put your money. Um, and so we were talking, you know, specifically that was around climate, but just the impact that you can have by investing in your, your money in a place that is using it for good. Um, and so I think a call to action to, to those on the call uh, to learn more about credit unions, to learn more about the impact that they're having both socially and environmentally. Um, and to hold us accountable and ask us questions. And so I think, you know, those on the call, keenly interested and, and connected and, and sometimes uh, credit unions uh, not so much uh, in western Canada but in this in this part of the country are, are kind of a, a best kept secret and so um, I think just yeah. Uh, yeah a call a call out to make sure uh, we all understand what uh, what the impact of participating with credit unions uh, can be love that and yes I know after this we're going to try and jump on that Instagram live to learn more about B Corp so have a good session thank you so and Maureen, would love to have you add to kind of this conversation around the programs and services that you're doing with Coast Capital. I know you touched you, but are there any other ones that you've implemented that impact communities? Yeah. Um, so we, um, I 
we definitely say that uh, Coursera is definitely our, our big push right now, and it's going to be coming in a number of different uh, ways, community, also to our employees, and, and uh, it's really important for us that we're giving our employees access to this platform and to our members, so um, that, that one is super exciting for us. We are um, uh, have just uh, this year launched a new partnership with uh, Windmill Microlending, um, and so excited to be able to partner with Windmill around uh, micro loans for newcomers who are looking to uh, upgrade their skills or re-credential in order to be able to work in their pre-arrival careers here in Canada. Mm -hmm. And um, we're really looking at um, partnerships like that as a tremendous opportunity for us to learn uh, from a partner who has been working in the space for a long time so that we can think about uh, how can we translate that back into the practices that we have uh, at Coast Capital. So we'll be uh, engaged in the investment committee and really taking a lot of those learnings in and um, participating also in the, they have a mentorship program, which is uh, uh, fantastic. So we'll be able to engage our employees uh, to work more directly with uh, windmill microlending. We're, we're very, very excited about that it's, uh, opportunity for us to, uh, to grow and learn along with that organization. They're doing some very, very good things. We um, uh, have a long commitment to uh, nonprofits um, uh, in our community. We have a, a, a great uh, nonprofit uh, banking package, of course, and uh, really a strong um, group of advisors who uh, work and support our nonprofit partners as well. And one of the things that we have um, recently um, uh, launched is our presenting partnership of the Thriving Nonprofits Program. And I don't know if you have heard of this. It's a partnership with Scale Collaborative. And it's a, I think there's five modules and the focus is around helping nonprofits to build their um, financial resiliency and specifically looking at how to diversify revenue streams. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a terrific program. Uh, we are going to be providing, um, I think, up to 20 of our own nonprofit members free access to the program, uh, but it is uh, delivered across Canada uh, and um, uh, looks at all different kinds of things, you know, whether the types of assets that a nonprofit may have, uh, social enterprises that they could be considering, um, partnerships and all the different ways that they could be um, trying to create more uh, stable and secure uh, revenue models for their organizations to serve them in, in, the, uh, in the long term. So that's a particularly exciting one that we're... Um, uh, We've been involved in the program for a number of years, but uh, this year we're looking to we're scaling it uh, so that it can be delivered right across the country. Excellent. And I would love to stay with you just for a sec for calls to action for the audience. Like, are there things that we can do to either support your work or just keep involved and yeah, be engaged? Well, I would say um, one of the things uh, that we, so we've shifted our model a bit as we've embraced a purpose um, to really develop sort of deep, traditional, longer term partnerships uh, uh, with, you know, um, community partners who uh, understand the issues uh, at a much more, um, you know, much deeper level than, than we can necessarily from our vantage point. So um, I would say a call to action is to, you know, to think about, um, uh, which businesses in your community uh, are interested in actually moving the needle on some of these things and not necessarily going to them with the program, but going to them just to have a conversation to see, you know, what are you interested in? Um, where are the gaps and the opportunities? And to, and to um, start a conversation where you can actually um, potentially grow something new together to uh, address that gap. I think there is, um, particularly as more businesses look to become more purposeful in driving impact, uh, there's a lot more opportunity for those kinds of relationships to grow. 
And then I, I, I would echo um, what Liz said. Credit unions are fabulous. Credit unions yes. are owned by their members. Mm. So they're, the profits are not going to shareholders. The profits are being reinvested through programs and services that the organization offers uh, and then through um, reinvesting in communities. So really do um, do have a look at your, your local credit union because they're, they're doing such great work. I would love that. And I know, Susan, you and I, we talk about getting more people into being a member of a credit union. But I did want to, you mentioned you started in this work at about 2000. So what keeps you going? Like, where does the passion come from that? And I know it's not easy. So what keeps you going each day and keeps you excited? For me, um, you know, it's also being part of the lived experience, right? When you, especially when you think about equity and equality and what you want to see for the community. Um, you know, this is part of what I like, what I do and doing it within the credit union system, you know, as, as Maureen um, alluded to, um, you know, this is not something you normally will get at bigger financial institutions like the banks. Um, we are um, nimble, we're humble, and we are really community focused. So um, I have been in the, the credit union system for as long as I for, you know, this is my 24th year. Um, and this is probably where I will end my career is in the credit union because of the work they do and their, how they give back to communities. So for me, it's really about that. And so as Maureen mentioned, and I have my own list of call to actions, but the first one will be um, join a credit union, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the Coast yeah. Capital or Alterna, um, you know, put your money where it's going to really make a big difference. Absolutely. Yes. Let's finish with the credit union. 20 years from now, we've got 20 more with you, Susan. But we'd love to have you go into your closing thoughts and those calls to action for our audience as well. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it's all about collaboration and communities. I started um, speaking about that and I probably end with it because the mm -hmm. center for how we collaborate with organizations is about openness, curiosity, and having similar alignment, alignments. Um, it's not something we do in silos. So we are always open to new ideas and models, as you know, Ryan, you and I are always sort of brainstorming on, you know, how can we work to improve our communities? So I invite organizations like we do ACBN to sort of reach out and sh share, you know, where they think there's a need for us to help. You know, what is it that you would love to collaborate on and can we come together and make that work? Because... Mm -hmm. I get, you know, we need those um, in our communities that have the lived experience and bring it forward so we can translate that into good financial products and services that will be inclusive for all. And, you know, Maureen mentioned this, but, um, you know, we are, um, like she mentioned, in precarious times with our economic and environmental systems. We have high inflation, high interest rates climate change, they're all playing a factor. So I think this is a time where we must lean in and as financial systems and structures, we have to offer financial advice and education to our members and communities, which is really important. If you go to the Alterna website, you're gonna see an advice column there where you can get some advice or you know, we've got our financial planners, everyone readily available to, you know, to work with our communities. But we also have to be proactive and be part of the solution in fostering equity and equality, well-being and resiliency. I think this is really important for all of us and to have top of mind. And so for us at Alterna, these are the reasons when I think about um, some of our programs, and I didn't go into depth about our granting program, um, you know, when we pick our representations for the year, for 2024, our grants will include causes in affordable and co-op housing, diversity, equity, and inclusion, environmental sustainability, and food insecurity. So um, right now, our granting program is open. You can go to the Alterna site and go to alterna.ca program and resources. 
And, um, you know, you don't have to be a, a, a member, but um, a nonprofit, you would have to be and apply for one of our small community grants in any of those four areas. Mm -hmm. And um, lastly, I would say that, you know, recently um, we had two blog posts, one which I wrote, which was why intentionality matters in the Black community and empowering women through entrepreneurship, a pathway to inclusive wealth. And these can also be found on our website. But, you know, these blogs, they went into details on recognizing what I would say is the multidimensional nature of racial and gender disparities and the barriers that we still must overcome. And so by taking the time to comprehend the lived experience, and I keep mentioning that, and the intersectionality identities of our members, um, you know, it helps us to dive into what the challenges are and how we confront those things. So I would just end by saying that I encourage everyone to keep working together, um, not only pro providing fund into underserved groups, but again, but, you know, looking at the tools, what other tools that we need in this environment that can help to empower and move our communities forward to success. Wonderful. And again, really appreciate time, Maureen, and our panelists' time and your remarkable leadership. And as we close out, we always like to close the way we begin our conversations by acknowledging the original stewards of the various lands we are on. We also acknowledge our ancestors. We acknowledge all those who have toiled without compassion or com compensation. We acknowledge all the elders and community stalwarts who shoulder stand on, build, share, and learn together for collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you for being part of this credit union panel. Again, to our audience, we really appreciate your presence. It is not lost on us, you taking time to be here to hear these enlightened conversations. And again, the conversations are gonna continue here with the People's Social Impact Conference. We have two more, so take a break. We'll be back in about an hour and looking forward to seeing you soon with our next conversation. Thank you, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Maureen. <laughs>